Hello friends, I'm Reverend Charlene Manuel. It is my honor to serve as a trustee on the board of the Parliament of the World's Religions. Please join me in a moment to acknowledge the presence of God as you understand God in your faith tradition. There is a sacredness in our gathering together in this way a belief, a common thread that acknowledges there is great hope in our collective future. So let it be so that the wisdom, the harmony, the joy that permeates this entire convening, that it may yield for each one of us a magnificent blessing that we take back into our communities and continue to serve our communities and to make a difference in our world. Let us all continue to strive for a world where there is peace, equality, fair and equal treatment for every person around the globe and an honoring and appreciation for our earth, the place we call home. God bless you. Distinguished organizers and eminent participants, dear friends, it is a special privilege to be invited to address a message to the 8th Parliament of World Religions, being held virtually this year for the first time, on the topic of opening our hearts to the world, compassion and in action. The pandemic that has, as we all have experienced, and as we all admit, brought the international community to its knees over the last 18 months, has indeed taught us the paramount lesson of our interdependence and of the need of solidarity, shared responsibility and common action. As we recently declared in a joint statement on the protection of creation that we signed with our brothers Pope Francis and Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, we realized that in facing this worldwide calamity, no one is safe until everyone is safe, that our actions really do affect one another and that what we do today affects what happens tomorrow. However, if the pandemic has changed the world around us, it should above all effectively transform our hearts and our lives, awakening them from indifference and directing them toward compassion for the victims of the vicious cycle of poverty, discrimination and marginalization, war, as well as every form of social and structural, structural injustice. And it is vicious precisely because it is the fruit of vice, greed and selfishness. The only way the cycle of sin can be corrected and reversed to a circle of life is through conversion or metania, metanoia, which is the Greek word for repentance that implies a radical change of mind, a real change of heart, and a practical change of behavior. This is the area where the world's religions have a vital and unique responsibility in the ministry of healing the injustices of society and the wounds of our planet. Religions are called to present an alternative model to what people often observe around them, avoid all expressions of morbid religiosity, 
such as fanaticism and fundamentalism, as well as all forms of racism and xenophobia. In the final analysis, religions must inspire a ministry of respect and reconciliation, which is sustained by genuine tolerance and reflects the mercy of God for the entire world as it is properly highlighted in the encyclical of the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church, Creed 2016, the oil of faith must be used to soothe and heal our wounds, not to rekindle fires of hatred. In this regard, religions are called to play a prophetic role leading the way of reconciliation and transformation, which requires commitment, courage, and conversion. Such a conversion of the heart is further strengthened through encounter and dialogue. This means that our aspiration for transformation is essentially a vision of connection and compassion a way of acting in and as a community. Therefore, it is not only religions which are called to this task. Every organization of social and global, of financial and political character should be dedicated to the pursuit of justice and solidarity in order to advance the welfare of society and perform the work that is pleasing to God and beneficial to humanity. This is our common way of costly sacrifice, but it is also the way of profound sacredness. May God's grace be with all of us in the pursuit of this noble effort. Thank you for your kind attention. A poem by Sri Chinmoy, his translation of his own Bengali. Sri Chinmoy said this poem expresses the spirit of Swami Vivekananda as he set out from India to America for the first World Parliament of Religions in 1893. Arise, awake, O friend of my dream. Arise, awake, O breath of my life. Arise, awake, O light of my eyes. O seer poet in me, do manifest yourself in me and through me. Arise, awake, O form of my meditation transcendental. Arise, awake, O bound divinity in humanity. Arise, awake, O my heart's liberator, Shiva, and free mankind from its ignorance sleep. Greetings to the community of the Parliament of World Religions. My name is Terry Tempest Williams, and I come to you from the ancestral and traditional homelands of the Nuuk people, Ute, Mountain Ute, Ure Ute, who live here still, and we honor them and these sacred lands. Finding beauty in a broken world is creating beauty in the world we find. And what I can tell you from the American Southwest is that we had a celebration and a ceremonial gathering of people from all over the Four Corners region honoring President Biden's decision to restore Bears Ears National Monument. 
the traditional grounds and healing spaces for the Diné, Navajo, Hopi, Zuni, Ute, Mountain Ute, and Ure Ute people. It was a good day and it felt like the beginning of reparations. Finding beauty in a broken world is creating beauty in the world we find. We've had a rough season this summer, early fall in the American West with over 7 million acres of fire burning these lands. Here in Utah, in the Red Rock Desert of the Colorado Plateau, we had temperatures up to 114 degrees. We are in the middle of a drought and in these mountains, south to us, over 10,000 acres burned. It feels that in this pause that is now a place, it is a transformative place. The pandemic has shown all of us that this is a liminal moment, a transformative moment, both a reckoning and an awakening at once. I can tell you that I've taken to night walking where cooler temperatures prevail and one can walk with the stars and I'm amazed at how our eyes pull color out of darkness. Light intensifies. We are not alone. Looking up into the constellations, I feel that they are the eyes of ancestors for all of us. Truly, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying that we might see beyond our own time. What are we to make of this moment? What are we to make of this climate collapse? I do not think it is just an ecological crisis or a political crisis, but rather a spiritual one. And as the theologian Larry Rasmussen has said, can we love this earth enough to change? Can we love each other enough to change? I want to share with you just a, a short piece from something I wrote called A Burning Testament. A young friend, Bianca, asked me from Los Angeles at a moment when she was very scared, wondering what the future was, what these fires meant, and this smoke. We were all enveloped in smoke. And when she woke up that morning, the only thing she could think about was an obituary for the land. And she said, Terry, will you write one? A pre-pandemic me would have said, I can't. But the liminal me in between these moments, these times of uncertainty and beauty said, I will try. And here's an excerpt. We cannot breathe. This is our mantra in America now. We cannot breathe because of the smoke. We cannot breathe because of a virus that has entered our homes. We cannot breathe because of police brutality and too many black bodies and brown bodies dead on the streets. We cannot breathe because we are holding our breath for the people and places we love. I was asked to write an obituary for the land, but I realize I am writing an obituary for us, for the life we have lost and can never return to. And within this burning of Western lands, our innocence and denial is in flames. The obituary will be short. The time came and these humans died from the old ways of being. Good riddance. It was time. Their cause of death was the terminal disease of solipsism, whereby humans put themselves at the center of the universe. It was only about them. And in so doing, they had been dead to the world that is alive. To the power of these burning, illuminated Western lands that have shaped our character, inspired our souls, and restored our belief in what is beautiful and enduring, I will never write your obituary. Because even as you burn, you are throwing down seeds that will sprout and flower. Trees will grow and forests will rise again as living testaments to how one survives change. It is time to grieve and mourn the dead and believe in the power of renewal. If we do not embrace our grief, 
Our sadness will come out sideways in unexpected forms of depression and violence. We must dare to find a proper ceremony to collectively honor the dead from the coronavirus as we approach over 4.5 million citizens globally lost. We must honor the lives engulfed in these Western fires and the lives we will continue to lose from the climate crisis at hand. Only then can we begin the work of restoration, respecting the generations to come as we clear a path toward cooling a warming planet. This will be our joy. Let this be a humble tribute, an exaltation, an homage, and an open-hearted eulogy to all we are losing, to fire, to floods, to hurricanes and tornadoes, and the invisible virus that has called us all home and brought us to our knees. We are not the only species that lives and loves and breathes on this miraculous planet we call Earth. May we remember this and raise a fistful of ash to all the lives hold, lost that it holds. Grief is love. How can we hold this grief without holding each other close? To bear witness to this moment of undoing is to find the strength and spiritual will to meet the dark and smoldering landscapes where we live. We can cry. Our tears will fall like rain in the desert and wash off our skins of ash so our pores can breathe, so our bodies can breathe back the lives that we have taken for granted. The world is still so beautiful. I will mark my heart with an X made of ash that says the power to restore life resides here. The future of our species will be decided here not by facts, but by love and loss. Hand on my heart, I pledge allegiance to the only home I will ever know. May we pledge our allegiance to this beautiful broken planet we call home. Deep gratitudes. I send greetings from our lovely seat sanctuary in Dehradun to the Parliament of World Religions. We are joining to talk of compassion in action. My compassion in action has been saving seats as the gifts of creation, as the gifts of our ancestors in its seed is a history of a culture. One wild rice plant to rise a sativa became the 200,000 rices, of which we saved 750 right here in Dune Valley. Another 1,500 in Orissa. Seeds that can tolerate salt during the cyclone, floods during the havoc of climate change, drought during extreme failure of rainfall. We are living through a COVID emergency, climate emergency, health emergency, economic emergency, hunger emergency. We live in an interconnected world and we've been disconnected. We've been made to believe that we are separate from nature. We are her masters, we are her conquerors, and worse, we are the owners of seed. This has been my dedication for compassion and action. That seed is not an invention, it's not a machine, it's not intellectual property. It is the link between us and the earth. It is the link between us and our ancestors. It is a link between us and future generations. In the seed lies nutrition. We've been made to believe that we have to manipulate seeds, genetically engineer seeds, toxify seeds to grow more food. Nothing could be further from the truth. Compassion in action is seeing the truth of life around us, the truth of biodiversity, its abundance, as long as we serve nature. When we give a little bit back of her gifts, the little bit of the straw that the rice gives us, back to the soil to feed soil organisms, we remember we are part of the earth. 
We are human because we are of humus. We are atoms because we are of atomus. We are made of soil and we have been made alienated. We are made of seed and we have been turned into conquerors. Compassion in action in our time of climate havoc, which is taking lives, of COVID and pandemics that's taking lives, of hunger that's killing 11 people per minute every day, every minute. This is compassion in action. A little bit of work to protect the seeds of love, the seeds of compassion, the seeds of abundance, the seeds of hope, the seeds of freedom. Even more importantly, let us create Edens everywhere. Let us create gardens of hope everywhere. Our compassion in action can address the multiple epidemics and crises we face. Our compassion in action through love and giving and care is more powerful than all the destructive forces of the earth. Let's join our hands, our hearts, our minds to create a revolution of compassion in action. I am with you in spirit as are the seats that surround me. Hello friends, I'm Phyllis Curat, Program Chair for this 2021 Parliament of the World's Religions, and I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of you, esteemed speakers, presenters, and participants, the trustees and the staff, Thank you. Thank you all for embodying the best of who we are when we open our hearts to one another and to the world. During this convening from our diverse faith perspectives, we found common ground in confronting crucial issues, especially our greatest existential crisis, climate change and the devastation of our planet. We have finally begun to speak truth to our own abuse of power. We've begun to acknowledge that our faiths, especially in the West, have contributed to our abuse of Mother Earth, our mistreatment of her as if she were devoid of divinity and ours to dominate and exploit. We have spoken the words penance, atonement and contrition, and we've committed ourselves to action. We have taken the first steps towards reconciliation, but we are still far from understanding what it means to live in harmony with the natural world. There is another perspective I would like to share with you as a Wiccan priestess, a witcha, rekindling the wisdom traditions of my Euro indigenous ancestors. At its heart are three essentials, the oneness of spirit and nature, our relationship with the natural world rooted in gratitude, respect and reverence, and humbly attending to nature as our teacher. There is so much that we have forgotten, but we're blessed the natural world is constantly revealing its wisdom for living in a sacred way because the world itself is sacred. For six billion years, life has evolved, nourished and supported by Holy Mother Earth. And all living things have lived according to her wisdom. Only we humans have forgotten. And so the earth is dying. It's easy to despair. And even as this catastrophe accelerates, if we will pay attention, everything we need to fix what we have broken, to heal what we have wounded, to rediscover how we are meant to live is still all around us. It's also a part of us because we are part of nature and our human nature is better in nature. We're less anxious and more altruistic. Our hearts open as we bear witness to beauty, to peace, to mystery, in the murmuration of starlings swirling in the autumn dusk, whales who sing to each other across the seas, the seas from which mists will lift in the morning and wrap around tops of ancient sequoia, who are exhaling the breath of life you are inhaling now. And a thousand seeds will grow from one nourished by the earth, all infinite embodiments that make the invisible visible. Open your heart to the world and you will see the sacred. You will see the compassion of creation expressed by the great and sacred organizing principle of Mother Earth. Biologist Janine Benrus calls it nature's secret, nature's magic. I call it nature's revelation. 
It is that life is constantly creating the conditions, healthy air, water, soil, temperatures, everything that makes the world more welcoming for all life. Let me say that again, more simply. Life is always making the world better for all life. This is the embodied spiritual wisdom, the green golden rule within the open heart of my faith tradition. And as has been wisely said throughout this convening, each of our faiths has a sense that there is a common source for all of creation, and that source is sacred. Now we must find the common sense that creation itself is sacred. Our future, the future of our family, of all living beings, the future of our mother earth depends upon it. So let us open our hearts to the world. Thank you. Ore salito falo, ore salito falo. Beni anta o o masiba o, beni anta o o masiba o. O ti toku ifanyo la ye. My friend, hasten to ifa. If someone is deceiving you, do not accept. Truth is better. The future of the world belongs to Ifa. Open our hearts and compassion. All these are very good things. And people and practitioners of all religions and all faiths have been practicing this since time immemorial. But we may have been practicing it the wrong way. Compassion and opening our hearts should not involve finding a way to convert other people by force or in a violent way to our own point of view or to our own belief. This has been the stock in trade of Islam and Christianity for more than a thousand years. We need to put an end to this. We need probably to petition the UN to make a proclamation that all the religions of the world are valid and one is no, not more valid than another. All the religions those who have holy books and those uh, which are enshrined in chants or recitations, they are all valid and they are all part of the wealth that we all have that we can share among ourselves. We can share this by letting our fellow men and women know the good things in our own practices, in our own beliefs, and share all those things with our fellow men and women without the need for them to convert in a forceful way or a violent way to our own way of life. There is another opening of hearts that we have all neglected. That's what I want to emphasize. Open our hearts to the world of animals, to the world of birds, insects, 
microorganisms, fishes, the world of trees, shrubs, grasses, the world of waters, oceans, lagoons, lakes, rivers, wetlands, the world of mountains, hills, the world of sands, soils, the world of non-humans. This is where we need now to focus our attention as people of faith so that we can help the entire world of humans to survive. The, world, the religion that I espouse, the religion of the Yorubas, which is no longer uh, based uh, on uh, one continent in Africa, of Africa, but which is now a property of the entire world. It's a religion that worships nature. We, unless and until human beings have the greatest respect or even worship all this world of non-humans, our future and our survival is not going to be guaranteed. We need to do better, to find a way to make our peace with the world of non-humans of which we are human beings an intrinsic part. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Yang Jin Lamu. I'm from 是我人生中最大的热情和最重要的事情。大地的呼吸这首歌是多年前我一个人在山里闭关的时候，我接受到很多大地母亲的讯息。大地母亲生病了，是我们人类过度的破坏这个地球而造成的，所以人类今天也生
尊敬的宗教朋友们，大家平安，大家好。灵性超越了距离的阻隔，紧密地把我们连接在一起。世界宗教大会是我们凝聚与连接的时刻。时局越是艰困、混乱。我们越要坚持信念，加强合作与交流，让枯竭的心灵得到滋润，而改变一切。今天的地球面临各种的迫在眉睫的危机，新冠肺炎肆虐全世界，许多人面临。和挚爱分离的一种痛苦，气候变迁引发生态与环境的浩劫，保护地球的行动已刻不容缓。战争与冲突造成无辜者的伤亡与流离失所，整个世界因此惶恐不安。现在，让我们。虔诚的祈祷，宗教家扮演众神的使者，引领人类找到灵性的源头，回归生态最初的光明与纯净。让我们虔诚的祈祷，科学家成为时代的先知，提供完善的方法来珍惜地球，复原地球。固有的生态能量，让我们虔诚的祈祷，祈愿人类迈向灵性的觉醒，生态和谐，以尊重的心连接众生与一切生命，回到我们共同的灵性根源，是让所有的生命相依相存，互济共生。打造一个爱与和平的世界。从此刻起，更要付诸行动，包容多元，相依共存，重建地球与人类身心灵的完整连接，让我们的心回家，让一切重回正轨。祝福大会成功平安，谢谢，谢谢大家。Every individual on this planet arrives with untold divine potential. This reflects the belief that God created humans in His own image, and of the 8.4 million life species on our mother planet, humans are the most evolved. Since they are divinely endowed with exceptional intelligence and reasoning power, they have a responsibility. To exercise the very best choices in protecting the environment and its diversity of life, six scriptures inform us that foundation of dharma or faith is compassion, and that Mother Earth itself rests upon divine compassion in perfect equilibrium. To exploit and plunder its resources and gifts is akin to not respecting one's very own mother. The Earth's present suffering is not the fault of governments or individuals alone, but the state of spiritual poverty we have collectively slipped into by amassing and circulating the traits of selfishness, greed, arrogance, apathy, or neglect. What we need is an economy of virtues to trade and invest and grow the qualities of compassion, integrity, contentment, humility. Courage and love, the core qualities.
These invisible yet vital resources will enable us to respond with the deep care and commitment which the environmental crisis now demands. Certainly then, we must sensitize ordinary individuals to make wiser consumer and lifestyle choices. But this does not absolve societies, institutions and corporations who shape the policies, infrastructure, flow of resources and dominant values by which populations tend to live. Behind all individual and corporate decision making lies the human mind. To sensitize it to serve and protect the environment, a new relationship must be cultivated between secular and religious modes of explaining creation. Science helps us to understand the impact of our choices on climate change and to devise workable solutions. Yet some of the high impact activities of governments, such as nuclear testing on land and in oceans, remain unknown to the general public. Scientists alone, however, cannot generate the revolution of heart, which is now urgently needed. For this, the world's religious and spiritual traditions provide a repository of wisdom, which is still waiting to be fully harnessed. As Sikhs, all of our symbols of empowerment point to a need for humans to courageously awaken from their spiritual slumber and to persevere to make a better world for Sarbat Dapala, the well-being of creation in its entirety. Compassion and contentment, we are taught, are the very qualities which underpin dharma, the harmonic order of universe, and they must now underpin our intelligent responses to the environmental crisis. We know, for example, that global meat production has a very sizable impact on climate change. In a world where meat has become a leading fast food, both the Dharmic and Abrahamic faiths remind us to apply compassion in our habits of consumption. Scriptural traditions inform us to relate to nature and its creatures with reverence rather than as commodities. Such teachings on life's sacredness guide us to rethink and change our patterns of consumption for the good of all. To close, allow me to state inner change in consciousness must precede outer change. We must seek out timeless wisdom, nurture our minds with virtue, learn to lovingly control it, love unconditionally, stop blaming, condemning and ridiculing, exercise compassion and forgiveness, practice benevolence and benevolence and sacrifice, control the ego and embrace humility. Harness the power of sharing, value, identity, and interdependence. Commit to interfaith engagement. Relinquish ownership and conserve for posterity. And the world around us will become transformed. Thank you. My dear brothers and sisters, it's a great honor to address you, people who've come together because of a calling in the heart for human unity. The call for human unity goes back a long way. In the Upanishads is a mantra. The world is one family. In fact, that's over the parliament in India, that statement. And if you look at the iteration of the golden rule, it really is an affirmation of treating all lives as one wants to be treated. And you find some iteration of it in every single wisdom tradition and every religion. When Jesus said, treat your neighbor as yourself, neighborhood was relatively small. But today, neighborhood is a moral location. And I would say that the neighborhood is the entire planet. That spiritual admonition, guidance, of seeing the human family as one, as a doorway to recognizing the sacredness of all life, of course. But that first step of seeing 
the unity of humanity is now not just a spiritual imperative, it is a practical necessity. 50 to 70 percent of our oxygen comes from the phytoplankton, which depends on the health of the oceans. And climate change is dramatically affecting the Gulf Stream and the very pH of the oceans, and thus our very lungs. Pandemics don't recognize borders. We can't live in a vaccine apartheid world. And nuclear weapons threaten every life on the planet. When the Golden Rule was first articulated in each of the faith traditions, the capacity of destroying the future didn't even exist. But today that practical reality is before us. And those of us who want to bring love into action are seeking traction to bring the information that we're receiving from our conscience in the heart into action. And I have a suggestion. Out of this exalted parliament should be a call to every institution that has a moral legitimacy, every faith institution and university, that they should at least follow the investment guidelines of a secular state, Norway, that took its benefit from the windfall of the oil in the North Sea into a pension fund that's now over $1.2 trillion in value. No investments in enterprises that violate human rights, such as child labor or slavery. No investments in enterprises that grossly violate the environment, so no fossil fuels. And no investments in enterprises that benefit from weapons of indiscriminate effect, landmines, cluster munitions, and nuclear weapons. So these three, ending poverty, protecting the climate, ending nuclear weapons, are together. The poverty of values is the most severe poverty we face today. And those of us in this exalted gathering are people who come together because of the values that have awakened in our hearts. And the highest value is the value of love. So we've made the journey from the head to the heart and found the importance of loving one another. We now have to bring it from the heart to the hand and, 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 and bring it into action. It's my prayer that that same power that awakens our conscience, that causes us to have hearts of gratitude, give us the wisdom and the courage to accept the blessing and the faith that we can bring our love into action and love our neighbor as ourself for this and future generations, for the glory of the gracious gift of our time together in life and for the fulfillment of becoming fully human. May we become fully human and examples of that love that we feel so powerfully in each of our hearts. Thank you so much. And God bless those who help bring this meeting together. Thank you. And God bless all of us and bring peace to our lives and to the wonderful web of life itself. Distinguished participants to this unique virtual 8th Parliament of the world's religions, brothers and sisters of the world, I turned 90 in March and have personally witnessed the dramatic changes that have taken place on the planet over the last 70 years. Science and technology have indeed made extraordinary progress and human beings are now ready to break into outer space and perhaps even begin permanent settlements on other planets in the next decade. It is a cruel irony, however, that despite this phenomenal progress, our own planet is now itself in danger due to human greed and exploitation. Climate change has brought us to a tipping point, and unless all the nations of the world really cooperate in controlling carbon gas emissions and taking other necessary measures, we may well be in for a major calamity by the end of the next decade. It is therefore fitting 
that the interfaith movement is working closely with the environmental movement. However, we must remember that the primary purpose of the interfaith movement and of the World Congress is to bring about a better understanding between different religious communities. We find that there are still many regions in the world which are plagued by inter-religious conflicts and there are organizations active around the world determined to create chaos and mayhem wherever possible. To confront these forces, it is essential for the interfaith movement to have a clear philosophical underpinning. There are many articulations of this, including the excellent statement issued for the 1993 parliament held in Chicago, which I attended. It is in this context that I venture to place before this distinguished audience a set of five sutras, cryptic statements, compassing a wealth of meaning, based essentially on the Vedantic philosophy, which between them give us a roadmap for addressing the multiple problems that humanity faces today. The first sutra, Isha Vasimidam Sarvam Yatkin Jagatyam Jagat, says that this entire cosmos, from the stately walls of the galaxies to the frenetic rock and roll of subatomic particles, is inhabited by the same divine power. This represents the philosophic correlate to the unified field theory that scientists are seeking to explain all the multiple phenomena in the universe. Almost all religions believe in an overarching divinity that pervades the universe, which in the Hindu tradition is known as Brahma. Second Sutra, Ishwara Sarvabhutanam Hridyeshe Tishthati, the Lord resides in the heart of all beings, holds that this pervasive divine power also resides in each one of us, known in Hinduism as the Atman. This is ultimately the golden thread that links the entire human race into what my third sutra, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is a family, expresses. It is only in our lifetimes that science and technology have given us instant communications, the internet, television, and a vast array of technological instruments which have unified the world as never before. However, these instruments have been used for aggression, terrorism, and interreligious conflicts. Until we realize that in the final analysis, planet Earth is a single living entity and that calamities such as the COVID pandemic and climate change can never be controlled unless all countries, regardless of their location or ideology, work together in cooperation. The fourth sutra, Ekam Sat Tripra Bahuda Vadanti, the truth is one, the wise called it by many names, is the very foundation of the interfaith movement. The Hindu acceptance of multiple paths to the divine is, I would submit, a prerequisite for any meaningful interfaith dialogue. We can be totally committed to our particular religion, but unless we accept the fact that different religions offer differing paths to the divine, we will never attain a peaceful global society. In this context, we must adopt an individual inclusivist and not an exclusivist approach. The final sutra, Bahujan Sunghai, Bahujan Hitayacha, speaks of the welfare of the many, the happiness of the many. This means that apart from working for our own salvation, all of us in the interfaith movement must commit ourselves to help the less fortunate members of society to attain a decent standard of living. In this context, I would like to condemn in the strongest possible terms the despicable phenomenon of human trafficking, especially of children. I was shocked to learn recently that this is now a hundred billion dollar a year business, which is quite astonishing. We must do whatever we can to confront this obnoxious practice. How can the welfare of the many be ensured if such a reprehensible practice is continued? Friends, if together we accept the five sutras that I placed before you, we will begin to fulfill our responsibility as members of the interfaith movement and to move towards a peaceful and caring global society. Our beautiful blue planet, a speck of light against the unending vastnesses of outer space, has nurtured us up from the slime of the primeval ocean two billion years ago to where we are today. Let us not further defile it with our thoughtless exploitation of nature or our internecine conflicts 
in the name of the all pervasive divine let us rather repay our debt to her nurture her heal her wounds and behave as children should towards their mother may the force be with you nurse The prayers I'm going to recite for you today are in ancient Avastan language that are the oldest and foundational prayers in the Zoroastrian literature. They are offered today reflecting the theme of this virtual convening, opening our hearts to the world, compassion and action. Ashem bahu vaishtamasti ushtasti ushtahamai yadashai vaishtai ashem. Righteousness is the best good and it is happiness. Happiness is to him or her who is righteous for the sake of the best righteousness. The second prayer now. Yathahu veryo yatharatush ashadachit hacha vangyaush dasdamaningo shothaninam angoshmastai shatrimchai ahurai I am Darik Popyo Dadatvastarem. Leaders act according to his will. So the re religious leader, due to his rights and other virtues associated with it. The gift of Bahumana, the good mind, is for those working with Aura Mazda in this world. He who acts as the protector and nourisher of the poor accepts the sovereign rule of Avra Mazda for the entire world. Yatha Zamyad, Yatha Ami, may it be as we wish. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil-alameen, نبينا محمد وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وبعد الحضور الكرام والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يطيب لي في البداية أن أهدي حضراتكم جميعا تحيات الأزهر الشريف وعلمائه وفي مقدمتهم فضيلة الإمام الأكبر شيخ الأزهر الأستاذ الدكتور أحمد الطيب حفظه الله ومتعه بموفور الصحة والعافية وتمنياته الصادقة لمؤتمرنا الكريم بتحقيق الغايات المنشودة المتابعون الأكارم إن العالم يعيش أزمة حقيقية تتمثل في غياب القيم الأخلاقية الحضارية التي حرص حرصت عليها أديان السماء والتي بها تستقيم الحياة ويتلاقى ويتعارفون ولذا حرص عقلاء الأمم وحكماؤها على تأكيدها ونشرها بين الأمم والأفراد على السواء وغياب هذه القيم ينذر بكارثة كبيرة بدت ملامحها في هذا العنف الذي تنوعت أشكاله والذي وصل في بعض بقاع الأرض إلى إزهاق أرواح الأبرياء في نزاعات لا مبرر لا على الإطلاق فضلا عن هذا الإرث الثقيل من الكراهية التي ملأت نفوس كثير من الناس زورا وبهتانا ومما لا يخفى أن التواصل بين أتباع الأديان العالمية يقطع الطريق على أصحاب الفكر المنحرف والسلوك المعوج الذين يقودون البشرية بأفكارهم وممارساتهم إلى هلاك ودمار وهذا التواصل والتلاقي تزداد أهميته بين الناس يوما بعد يوم وبخاصة إذا تولى مسؤوليته أفراد أمناء ومؤسسات أمينة لها وزنها وظهر اعتدال منهجها الحضور الكريم لقد جاء الإسلام بجملة من المبادئ الأخلاقية والقيم الحضارية التي تنطلق من قيمة الرحمة وتدور حولها ومن ذلك أنه لم يفرق بين بني الإنسان بسبب اللون أو الجنس أو اللسان فهم جميعا من أصل واحد وأب واحد وأم واحدة قال تعالى
يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء ومنه أن نفس الإنسان مصونة معصومة وأن قتل نفس واحدة كقتل الناس جميعا وأن إحياء نفس واحدة كإحياء الناس جميعا قال تعالى من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا وتعد قيمة الرحمة من أبرز القيم الدينية والحضارية والأخلاقية التي تعزز إنسانية الإنسان وبها جاءت الأوامر الإلهية في الكتب السماوية ونظرة إلى مادة الرحمة في القرآن الكريم وهو كتاب الإسلام الأول تؤكد أن قيمة الرحمة محور التشريع والتكليف وأساس العبادة والمعاملة وأصل الإيمان والممارسة فالله هو الرحمن الرحيم ورحمته وسعت كل شيء وحين أدرك الأزهر الشريف بحسه الديني وواجبه الإنساني ودوره العالمي حاجة البشرية إلى هذا النور الذي يبدد ظلمات العنف والتطرف ويكشف الطيارات المنحرفة استخرج من نور الوحي وثائق متعددة جاءت صورة تطبيقية عملية لقيمة الرحمة فأكدت أهمية المواطنة والعيش المشترك وأسست للأخوة الإنسانية والأزهر الشريف يؤكد في وثائقه وبياناته وسائر أطروحاته أن الناس إخوة في الإنسانية وشركاء في الأوطان وأنهم جميعا متساوون في الحقوق والواجبات تجمعهم مواطنة لا إقصاء معها ولا تفرقة فيها وإنما هي مواطنة تقوم على قبول التعدد واحترام التنوع وتستلزم بالضرورة إدانة كل التصرفات التي يترتب عليها الازدراء والتهميش وما إلى ذلك من ممارسات يرفضها الإسلام وتأباها الأديان والأعراف الحضور الكريم إن الرحمة ليست مفهوما مجردا وإنما هي قيمة قابلة للتطبيق وقد فهم المصلحون معناها وعاشوها ممارسة عملية فكانت الرحمة عندهم أسلوب حياة وإن الدعوة إلى اتخاذ الأخلاق قيمة عملية تطبيقية يجيء في وقت تشتد فيه حاجة العالم إلى مبادرات حقيقية وجهد صادق وفاعل لكبح التطرف الديني والفكري ولفضح الأجندات الممولة التي تهدد بضرب أسس العلاقات بين الأمم وتغذي نظريات صراع الحضارات وصدامها ولذا فإننا نجدد الدعوة لقادة الأديان وللعقلاء في كل مكان أن يعيدوا اكتشاف قيمة الرحمة وأن يعملوا على تحويلها إلى واقع ملموس من خلال ممارسات تحمل للعالم السلام والعدل والخير وفقكم الله والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I am Andrew Harvey and in honor of sacred activism and in honor of the appalling suffering that is now erupting on every level all over the world, I am not going to mince my words. I'm going to speak to you nakedly and directly. It is time for all of us to recognize that we are now in an apocalyptic situation. The apocalypse isn't coming, it is here, and it is erupting in massive interlinked crises that seriously threaten the future of the human race and a great deal of nature. The most serious of these is, of course, the climate crisis. And I want to read to you something that David Ray said about the recent IPCC report from the UN, which was a dire warning. 
Dave Ray is the director of Enlightened Climate Change, and he said, and this is said to you and I as spiritual leaders, world leaders must have the findings of this report seared into their minds and take urgent action. This is not just another scientific report. This is hell and high water writ large. My friends, as spiritual leaders, I believe we are called now to do three things. The first thing that you and I, I believe, must do is stop in any way softening the agony and urgency and desperate danger of the situation that humanity is in. We must stop in any way offering false hope and false opium. We must stop ourselves pretending and we must help the human race find through grace the power and the strength to be able to stand to see what must be seen if we have any hope in hell or heaven of getting through. That is the first thing and I have to say that in my 30 years as a spiritual leader, I have been aghast and shocked by how few spiritual leaders are truly prepared to stand up and tell the truth to the people who so desperately need it. The second thing that I believe as spiritual leaders we must do, and I urge the conference to plunge deeply into this, is to face without illusion and without magical thinking and without pseudo-politeness just how dangerous religion itself has become at a time like this. For all the talk of interdisciplinary, interspiritual, you know what, the religions still have some secret fantasy of being unique and still cling to their dogmas. All of this is useless in a situation like this. The divine is asking us to step dramatically out of any of our separate boxes and unite in the sacred heart unite in the burning, urgent, wild, holy, sacred heart so that we can forever end the human story of separation and come into radical unity at the moment in which radical unity beyond any dogma or difference is the only possible place from which we can have a hope in hell or heaven of doing anything real. The third thing that I beg you in this conference to address with the deepest passion that you are capable of and the deepest truth and the deepest intensity of purpose is the absolute necessity of saying to the people who listen to you as they listen to me, prayer and meditation and chanting and deep learning of the mystical traditions are not enough. They are foundational, they are essential, but they are not enough because they have to be the ways we access the courage and the power and the passion and the stamina and the peace and the trust and the faith to be able to stand up together in sacredly inspired action, urgent, sacredly inspired action. We can no longer give any kind of message to the human race that we can simply meditate or pray or chant 
this appalling apocalyptic crisis away, we have to say to everyone who will listen that while the divine is with us and in us, what the divine is demanding of us is that we plunge deeply into practice to give us the courage to stand up for justice and balance and harmony in every realm of the world, not just through our words, but through our loving, non-violent, but urgent actions. Sacred activism isn't just one more beautiful dish on the smorgasbord of possibilities. Sacred activism is the only way forward. We must go deep into our essential natures and go far out with the courage and inspiration we find in those essential natures to heal the planet. And we must do it now because time is running Thank you. As we come to the close of this unique eighth convening <clears throat> of the Parliament of the World's Religions, we focus on the future and on our common commitment to peace and to justice and to sustainability. We live in a time when humans have become a force of geological proportions and therein lies great opportunity and great responsibility. The visual statement which we are all about to see will be open on our website for anyone and everyone to download. Literally hundreds of us have helped shape it. It is not really a presentation, but an invitation to see the world as it is, to discern what is right and to act. There is no narration. Its images and its words speak for themselves. If they speak to you, then you must become the voice of the statement in loving conversation with others. We hope our visual statement will open the door to engagement and to action to shape a better world, truly inspired by our deepest beliefs.
about the differences Remember what we share We all have a common home Our planet needs our care Bring love again to Mother Earth Let self-love be our prayer Cause we are one Hello, my friends. Tech hiccups and all, I want to thank you for making the eighth Parliament of the World's Religions and the first ever virtual Parliament a resounding success. I want to thank all of our presenters and speakers throughout this event who filled this virtual convention center with their wisdom. I'd like to also thank all of our sponsors and exhibitors, especially our platinum sponsors, Fetzer Institute, Charter for Compassion, Lawyers for Love, UNICEF, unity and spiritual, spirituality and health. I would also like to thank our circle of patrons. The Buddhist Su Chi Foundation, founded by Dharma Master Cheng Yen. The Circle of Friends for VRG Vision. The Guru Nanak Sikh Interfaith Committee. And Bai Sahib Moh Mohinder Singh Alawalia OBE KSG. The chair slash patron of the Nishcom group of faith-based charitable organizations. I want to thank my incredible hardworking staff, Miriam Kazada, Emma Carr, Joshua Bassifin, Caleb Nyquist, and Jesse Smith. Our global ethic aficionado, Miriam Renaud. I also want to thank our supportive board of trustees who were key to the success of this event and supported and trusted in my little idea of bringing the parliament online at the time where we really needed to, to, to get together and we couldn't do it in person. I'd especially like to thank the chair of our board, Nitin Najmera, and our program chair, Phyllis Kurat. In 1893, at the close of the first parliament, President Charles Bonney said, and I quote, the influence which this Congress of the religions of the world will exert on the peace and the prosperity of the world is beyond the power of human language to describe. For this influence, borne by those who have attended the sessions of the Parliament of Religions to all parts of the earth, will affect in some important degree all races of men, all forms of religion, and even all governments and social institutions. Therefore, I want to thank all of you attended, you who attended. You are the Parliament of the World's Religions, and it is you who can go out and make this world a better place. Let this first, first virtual Parliament spread its influence both on and offline. Go out to the world spreading your light of love and peace for all the beings of this planet. So now we close this, the eighth parliament of the world's religions, but not without hearing from our chair, Nitin Najmera, who has a special announcement you are not going to want to miss. Thank you. Jai Jinind, I bow down to the Lord in all of you. And I would like to remain in this bowed position, for we had not expected such an overwhelming response to our digital parliament. 
few of us thought that after one and a half years of living our lives and interacting with each other through Zoom, Team, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, and other social and digital platforms, that we will receive a very lukewarm response to our effort to bring together and continue to champion our cause of universalism, brotherhood, and a global fraternity. But we were proven wrong. We have more than 4,000 registrations, not individuals, but possible families and groups, and continue to grow as a programming is available for 30 days for all of you to view. More than 550 sessions and five plenary sessions have created a space for further development of ideas and resolutions to our common problems. And we could not have done it without Phyllis Kurat, our chair of programming committee, and her team members, and the countless hours of coordination with Stephen Avino, our C chief operating officer and acting executive di director, who you just heard from, and the team of our parliament staff. The uniqueness of this convention is also the fact that we could get to your homes through our regional programming dedicated to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. I thank Reverend Barry Bear, Deborah Bojo, Damadipa Sak, Naeem Beg, Swami Ishatamanda, Dolly Dastur, Manohar Grewal, and Kehkashan Basu to put together a rich experience that, is, that was localized in its approach, but it brought a very law, uh, universal in its message. Trust me, gentlemen and ladies, we wanted to bring Latin America and Europe too. But as they all say, there's always a next time. And while I would like to thank many, and I know it will not be justified to take a few names and miss others, a special call out has to go to all of you, whether you were the trustee emeritus, past chairs, past board members, current trustees, management, staff, volunteers, leaders, representatives of religious faith, speakers from all continents, members, those who are not members, my circle of patrons, and everyone who came to the parliament since 1993, and those who came for the first time in this virtual parliament. The teachers, the kids, the musicians, the technicians, the technologists, the sponsors, the donors, and everyone who made this parliament a huge success. We could not have done it without all of you. And for those who believe in our mission, but have passed away since the Toronto session, we know you're watching from the heavens above and we thank you for your continued support. But what really makes this convention unique is your nimble fingers and our technology partners, Excel Events and Jeremy Fackenthal, who put all these videos together. The portal provided us to see the main stage, the breakouts, the workshops, the expo. And while you could interact with each other in networking lounges and on one on one, you gave this technology a life by giving your feedback and comments. Yes, live feedback, talking about your connective issue, issues and by resolving them by telling each other to use Chrome or restart or reload. Oh boy, you all made this parliament a great success. The media will not cover us because hopefully nothing went wrong. We will cover ourselves through our social media presence and write about all of this to everybody. I want to thank all of you and please thank your fingers for giving us a feedback that we would have never gotten otherwise. I came to the Melbourne Parliament for the first time and those memories have a special place in my heart. Issues of a dogmatic approach to spiritualism continue to exist, and we continue to work on programming and efforts towards global ethics, next generation, peace and justice, climate action, and women and gender inequality, indigenous voices, while new work areas of chaplaincy and spiritual intelligence in workplace are emerging. As we author our statement in this convention that you just heard from David, we stand by and strongly support to stop the age of Anthropocene and want to continue to work towards opening our skies to see Himalayas from the rooftops of Jalandhar, a town 250 kilometers away from the foothills of the Himalayas. So friends, we cannot rest for our work is not done yet. And if we do not finish it in our lifetime, we need to create a team that continues to carry forward the torch of love, fraternity, global peace, economic stability, 
intragenerational respect, justice, and seat for all at the table. In one of the lectures, it said that 84% of us are religious or spiritual in nature. And we need to bring forward our richness of a diversity with our differences. I call upon all of you to not to be shy and declare your religious orientations and allow for dialogues to happen so we explain our perspectives. So to continue and to establish the work forward on all our agendas and on behalf of the board of the trustees of the Parliament of the World's Religions, with Dolly Dastur as my co-chair, Safet as my treasurer, Charlene Manuel as our secretary and chair of the Global Ethics Committee, Kusumita Pedersen as a chair of Development Committee, Manohar Grewal as chair of the Communications Committee, Phyllis Kurat, our chair of Programming and Women's Task Force, David Hills, our chair of the Governance Committee and Climate Action Task Force, Bruce Knott, chair of the HR Committee and Peace and Justice Task Force, Kehkashan Basu, chair of our Next Generation Task Force, Michael Terrian, chair of our Nomination Committee, Carl Murrell, Scott Stearman, Swami Ishatmanda, Dhamma Deepasak, Deborah Bojo, James Lynn, John Palakowski, Naeem Bey, Thomas Lemberg, and Michael Balinski, my other fellow trustees, Stephen Avino, our Chief Operating Officer and Acting Executive Director, Joshua Basofin, Miriam Caseda, Emma Carr, Jesse Smith, Miriam Renaud, Caleb Nykis, and Michael Trice. Yes, I did not forget him. My friend and Chair of Site Selection Committee, I hereby declare and invite all of you in August of 2023 to the banks of Lake Michigan, to the beautiful expanse of the McCormick Center, the city that is a birthplace of interfaith religious dialogue, and to no other city but the city of Chicago, to a ninth, yes, you heard it, a ninth convention. We will be celebrating 130 years of the 1893 gathering and also the revival of the modern day parliament in 1993. We want to see you all there to make it a success. So please, more, we, more will follow as we plan, but please block your calendars for August of 2023 to be in Chicago. And now to our special guest, none other, but the mayor of Chicago, Ms. Lori Lightfoot. Yes, she's our guest of honor, and we work very closely with her departments to make Chicago 2023 a great success. Please welcome her as she speaks in the eighth convention and invites you to the ninth convention. And before I go, one more time, a big thank you. Dhanyavad, shukriya. This moment is a blessing in my life. And I ask for forgiveness if I knowingly or unknowingly hurt any of you through thoughts, action, or speech. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again in August of 2023. Jai Jinend and Michami Dukram. Over to Ms. Lori Lightfoot. Hello, everyone. I'm Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I want to first thank the Parliament trustees and staff for inviting me to speak at the 2021 Parliament of World's Religions. I have the honor of addressing you as the mayor of the city that holds a unique distinction, being the birthplace of the modern interfaith movement. Chicago was a host of the 1893 World's Parliament of Religions and has served as a home to faith and spiritual communities from around the world. And on top of that, in 1993, the global interfaith movement celebrated 100 years of its history in Chicago. In other words, communities of faith from diverse religious and spiritual traditions have been integral parts of the fabric of this great city. And we have been committed to serving as agents of change for justice, peace, and sustainability. And in 2023, Chicago is reaffirming its commitment to its history as the birthplace of the global interfaith movement and will continue working to cultivate harmony among the world's religious and spiritual communities to address the critical issues of our time. 2023 will also mark the ninth global convening of the parliament, which will acknowledge the 130th anniversary of the historic first parliament in 1893 and the 30th anniversary of the 1993 Parliament. 
It will be my pleasure to welcome the parliament, the interfaith movement, and all people from around the world to our historic city in 2023. But until then, enjoy this year's event and please continue to be safe. He brought me